Phil with Alpha Bow Hunting, and this is our new show, To The Point. All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, to The Point here with Phil Mendoza and Braden Forsyth. Bo is out sitting in a tree stand. Or maybe probably driving free. home. He's probably driving home in that, that storm. Snowstorm? Yeah, that snowstorm. So. Well, today what we decided to do was to answer uh, a few questions that, that have been submitted via email first. We might actually get into a second show with some uh, following up on some comments from some of the, the YouTube videos that um, the YouTube shows. So quite a bit to cover today, and we're going to go ahead and get right into it with the question, and actually it's a couple questions that Austin Pierce submitted. Um, first, first off is we'll, we'll go ahead and tackle one of the the questions first. As Austin says, he's a bow hunter. He's looking for to learn more terminology. Uh, at, you know, transitioning into po possibly doing more target shooting leagues, that kind of stuff. Winter, right? spring stuff, summer stuff. Yeah. And and we we see that a lot here at the shop to where bow hunters obviously. You, you got that hangover usually if, if it's just uh september october is a hangover right, right. anybody that gets to do any more like eastern plains hunting here or gets into the midwest to do any hunting then you see that hangover towards the end of the year but the, that target season really gets ramped up in around this time of year november december january and what we do here at no limits is we try to follow our target leagues to what's kind of the upcoming events right uh, Vegas being a big one, Vegas, the Vegas shoot that's usually end of January or early February uh, that shoots on this multi-phase target here and uh, then the, the NFAA indoor round that's usually in March that shoots on the, the blue and white targets that, that's like this here. So what we're going to try to cover a little bit here is you know some of the some of the common terminology when you see you guys talking about the scores that they shoot in a round like a 300 round. I shot a 300 with 27 X's or uh, some of the high high-end shooters that are able to shoot that 29 30x which That's not me. They got a few on the board. But not, my name's not on there. There's a few of them, but so the, the scoring on this type of target or the single uh, the single ring scoring basically it starts with uh, This the little baby circle in the center is, is the X ring That's kind of your tiebreaker in in most cases or your X count the, that next circle that's what about an inch and a half I would guess I don't have a tape measure here is your 10 ring and any indoor scoring any scoring event really even on 3d we got a, 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 vital, a vital of a 3d target here you touch all you need to do is touch the line to get the higher score uh, in in paper shooting um, what happens is let's say you start shooting a target and it starts to get chewed up a little bit and you can't see the line you actually are supposed to recreate where the line would have been to identify a score in 3d archery it's a little bit different if the the lines on a 3d target are a little bit shot up and dismembered and the line pulls over a little bit and it touches your shaft but it's not where it would be it, assuming it was new if it's touching the line it's touching the score you get the higher score so paper target shooting all you need to do is touch the line you get the higher score if the line is not visible you recreate the line so again ten ring is is the is not the smallest itty bitty circle that's about the size of uh, a nickel it's the next one out and then anywhere inside that second ring is a nine eight seven six obviously it goes all the way down to one on a, on a one uh, on a single face target so you're shooting three arrows per round for score if you're shooting a 300 round it's 10 rounds of three arrows for a score of best possible score of 300 with an X count right X count your tiebreaker right that's it and then um, in so there are some games very few but you can sh some some people shoot a 450 round which is 45 arrows same format uh, Vegas shoots 300 rounds they shoot three 300 rounds for a, a score of a best of 900 plus the X count to get into the shoot off you got to shoot clean you got to shoot all tens to for a score of 900 and um, they do have, I believe, the it's called a lucky dog. If somebody should just dropped one ten ring, they have a one person. They have shoot off. One person gets in. So this type of scoring, that's what you're looking at. Three arrows. You you see some people shoot a little bit fatter fatter arrows for this type of scoring, to hopefully grab that line or touch that line. That that's really, I mean, you can shoot your bow hunter setup at this type of game, zero issues. If your goal as a bow hunter is to just get better, in my opinion, I wouldn't get too crazy with 
having two or three bows just to have for different games. Shoot the bow that your end goal, that you, your, your goal to, to do, if it's hunting is your, your primary kind of task that you're trying to get better at, shoot that bow. You know, sometimes people will turn the bow down a little right. bit and wait, but get used to that bow in all, in all facets, you know, high pressure of, of situations. It is a target shooting type of game, 3D and, and hunting. You and know. that'll depend on, on, depending on how serious you want to get. That'll depend on the rules of the game. Um, what is it? Is it uh, one, one doesn't, who doesn't allow camo bows or any camo? Yeah, so, so USA Archery, um, That's what it is. That you, get some, you get into some organizations that they have, they get particular with regs on a tire, right? A ASA Archery, you're supposed to have a collared shirt if you're at a pro-am type shoot. So you just make sure you read the rules for those type, usually leagues. Lax. Right, usually pretty lax, and if, if you're if you're really just looking to get better as a bow hunter and shooter, which would be that's kind of my my use of, of these types of shooting. It's I, I, I'm not getting involved in tournaments where, where there's pro am or anything like that. It's more of a lax. Yeah. Hey, just shoot Thursday night league or Wednesday night, Tuesday night leagues here and that kind of. And thing. there's even good local shoots that are that are lax. You get you some get you some practice in a little bit more pressured environment. Um, but yeah, so and then so the, the next kind of target face you usually see quite a bit is an NFAA round, which you're actually shooting five arrows per round as opposed to three arrows. Uh, this game you're usually scoring, it's also a 300 score, but you're shooting at uh, the X's is a tiebreaker again, but the, 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 the bigger white circle is scored as a five. So you got five, four, is the, this whole area is actually a four, so if you're off of this on a five spot, it's a it's basically five four or a zero. Um, the X again being a, the tiebreaker. So you'll you'll see the terminology in this game is very common. It's like I shot a three hundred with fifty two X's or fifty seven X's, or somebody shot a two ninety seven. That means they had three arrows that left this white this white ring into the blue, or maybe you shot a, a single face target and it scored even an arrow down from that. But typically. Um, that's what you're seeing again terminology is is what I, I promise you if you go to one league and the people there are halfway decent which most leagues are right. full of great people um, you're gonna get the gist of it with one night of shooting so don't be intimidated to go shoot uh, whether it's league at, at your local pro shop or you know go try a local event you know yeah. I mean the idea is to hit the metal I mean that's it. When, I, when I simplify things it is to hit the metal I'll figure it out later you know in, so. in a nutshell that's it so terminology wise that's kind of the scoop there as far as looking at um, vitals on a on a 3d target which this one's a little bit beat up but you know you've got a couple different main organizations that, that do scoring IBO and ASA IBO being the center 11 ring here is your is your kind of your bonus ring ASA is scoring either the low, the low 12 or the high 12. You got to usually call for the high 12. 10 ring is the about four and a half, five inch center. The vitals is eight. The 14 ring is usually only play for ASA and in shoot off format for the most part. Most most ASA events I think have got away from using that into normal scoring. It's been a little while since I've shot a sanctioned ASA event, but um, that's in the nutshell. I mean, you're again, it, it's likely in these type of targets on a 3d target where the foam starts to get shot up and you can see some of this I don't know how good you can see on the camera if you're watching it or if you're listening but you can see some of the the uh, the foam can get chunked up in places and if that ring happens to the, the scoring ring happens to, to break where the foam is and bend over and your arrow maybe is an eighth of an inch outside of it but that line is actually touching it technically you're supposed to get the higher score all you need to do is touch the line it's not your responsibility for recreating the line and again, it's that's that's one of the bigger differences for scoring on 3D archery to paper archery or target archery is um, is how it's scored. So, Braden, kind of put it in a nutshell. The goal is to hit put in the middle, right? right. I understand, understand your purpose with with your practicing. If if you're looking to be just a better bow hunter. Um, and you just want to shoot your bow more under more pressure situations. Understand that going into any event you, you look at going into, even if it's just a weekly league fun shoot, you know, on your on, on a 3D course, um, t take some purpose into your training. So go in there, have fun. We're, we're always looking to have fun, but but take some purpose and, and say, hey, I, I'm, I'm aiming for, I want to hit all tens tonight, or, or no eights or no fives or whatever it may be, and set, set some goals that are really 
help focus that training. You're not just out there shooting arrows, you know, making good releases and you're, you're training properly. So use these things if you're going to use them for, for your end goal as, as a bow hunter, like me, that, that, that's why, how I use these. Um, it's not necessarily for scoring or winning, but it's a little bit of pressure, you know, betting with your buddies, that yep. kind of thing, and, and and adds a little bit of pressure to the situation and and works on different uh, different aiming points and, and different sight pictures. So. Yeah, I, I tell you, if you've never shot, you know, whether it's a paper tournament or a 3D tar tournament, if you've never shot one, even though the, it's different because on a 3D event, you're usually with three to five people in a group. In a paper tournament, you might be with 30 people on a line. The added pressure that you experience there, you you need to put yourself in those kind right. of situations, in my opinion, as a bow hunter, because even though in the field, it's only 99.8% of the time, 97%, whatever you want to, I mean, depend if you're hunting with a group or you're filming, the only, the only I don't want to say person, right? But an an it's you and the animal that know what's what happens if you get a shot right. off on that animal. Right. And in many respects, if you shoot at that animal three times and you miss all three times, who's going to know that between besides you and the animal? So that it's it's one of those things that I'm not saying it's easy to lie. If you miss right. it, right. it happens. We all miss. It's taken me a couple of weeks to come up with the honest truth sometimes in some of my <laughs> show, stories. Show up back to camp with one arrow in your quiver. <laughs> but what I'm saying is it's the perspective and the mindset of get yourself in a high pressure situation ahead of time so that way in that event you do get you know face to face with that animal and that experience and let's say you haven't been there but before or you haven't been there that often you're going to be better off you're going to learn you you will have known how to handle it a little bit better because of the times you put yourself into various high pressure situations you know and i'll promise you that that first first few times you do that in any kind of uh competitive event you're going to experience that right that i mean just perfect example is, is go shoot a 3d with your buddies and just bet a dollar on a shot yeah what watch how your your heart rate increases just a little bit i mean we all have that competitive drive that's i, I think that's why we do we, we're bow hunters it's challenging um but our buddies you say put a dollar on it that pin may that pin may float a little bit more that you know that shot may not execute as well because you get a little bit more pressure so yeah oh, oh yeah do, do what you need to to dial it up because it, it is it's beneficial and um, like I said, just the more the more ways you can do it. That's why the we created the Alpha Challenge events because it's just a different element to shooting with the high uh, elevator. Training rate. tools, right? And yep. It's different training tools for different scenarios and different aspects of, of bow hunting because there are so many. So yep. use everyone you can and everyone you got. So so we're going to go ahead and move on to you know Austin gave us a couple of good questions. The next one is you know name off some essential gear for building your own bow shop. There, many of you that, uh, you know, you may have a, a garage you want to set up to, to work on a bow. You might have the basement. We've got our, our youngest uh, uh, our, our future entrepreneur here. Everybody wants to turn around and say hi to the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Go sit down for me for a sec, okay, buddy? we got some of the, the young staffers in, in the building today. But uh, So anyway, essential gear for building your own bow shop. Again, if it's in your man cave or in your basement or, or your, your garage, you know, it, if you're looking to get more out of, you know, your, your accuracy and, and understanding your setup and tuning and super tuning things, you need to have your own tools for the most part. You can come to a pro shop like ours and we can work with you with a ton of stuff. However, it's a dollars and cents thing, just flat out, right? right? If somebody wants to sit here with with you for an hour and work on their setup, it, there's, a, there's a cost assessed with that. So, you know, on the flip side, somebody may say, well, I wanna learn to do this on my own and have it, and, cause I tell you what, I can't tell you how many 11 o'clock midnight that, that, tuning sessions I had. Yep, yeah, when, the, when the shop's not open, you're like, think it's sitting in bed or sitting there thinking, you're like, what if I did this? So you run downstairs and you tinker, you That's know it. what I mean? It, it, it just depends on how, how far you wanna go. Yeah. You know, what your setup needs to be, you know? if. If you don't want to ever press a bow, but you want to be able to do some things here and there. So that's where I kind of broke it down into a couple different like entry level stuff with, with setting up your own shop and then more advanced. And on the entry level side, I would probably recommend people get a good arrow vise, a bow vise, excuse me, first. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, whether it's just moving your peep sight, tying in your peep sight, tying in a D-loop, checking, you know, your, your sight levels and, and your arrow levels, those kind of things. 
if you have a good bow vise, huge. Goes a I, long way. I, I remember that early times when I didn't and trying you to even clamp? put even trying to put a sight on. I got the bow sitting on my lap. I got you know you trying to do a bow vise is, is worth its weight in gold just 100%. for even just holding your bow. You know? I, I tell you, you know, I I took you know those pistol grip. Yep. clamps yep. and I'd put my limb on, on the table and I'd find a skinny table and I'd clamp that sucker to the table sometimes and it wasn't in a great position but at least it held it so yeah you're right once you put once you put the the bow in a vise and you, it's, it's stationary and you can do what you need to with it that's in my opinion probably the number one tool I would suggest somebody to get is a good bow vise second to that you know some serving you, you, you want to have a uh, a good mix of servings your your 14 thousand your your 17,000, your 21,000 for you know different applications. 21,000 servings more in that center serving. Uh, your 17, 18,000 like a, a 3D from BCY is great for peep servings or sometimes repairing uh, cams. But then then you get into your halo, your 14,000s for. As you start to really tinker with things, and this is something that I I've done over the years, you know, increasing strand count in a cable for more tension. We talked about holding weight. You know that's one way you can directly uh, increase a little bit of holding weight is if you add some strands to your cables you've got a little bit more lateral uh, tension on, on a string when your stops hitting it so when you do that usually to get it to fit in the tracks you got to downsize your serving size a little bit so understanding the different serving sizes and where they go having you know they're, they're usually tw 8 to 12 8 to 15 bucks for a, a roll of serving I would get two or three different rolls of serving in the different sizes Next to that, I would probably look at an arrow like a fletching jig. Yep. I think that learning to fletch your own arrows, um, learning to tinker with fletching your own arrows goes a long way. Um, <laughs> you can go right in the middle, aren't you? Anybody watching on the YouTube feed knows that uh, we've got uh, my youngest son here. He's, he's adding some, some entertainment he's here. He's getting involved. And, and we're going to let him do it because um, he's, got, he's got work to do. Right, buddy? <laughs> so... Um, fletching jig, uh, so with that, you know, you, you can really start to uh, eliminate some variables, narrow down some things, tinker with things, right. and then when you get into broad shooting different broadheads, yeah, I fletch got, three or I four. Got work. Okay. Buddy, fletch three or four arrows differently and, and shoot, see how they stabilize a broadhead. Um, arrow uh, grain scale is super important there. A squaring tool for your arrows is super important to add to that. You know, whether you want to add an arrow saw or not. You can get a, a good medium of the road, medium grade arrow saw for 120, 140 bucks. Right. You know, so depending on your budget, that's what I would add. I would actually do all that before I even looked into a bow press or a drawboard. I, actually, the drawboard you can probably get at any time. I mean, a drawboard. A lot, a lot of this. I mean, I've seen guys on you know on YouTube or the internet where they've they've made arrow saws out of you know. A high speed saw they bought from Harbor Freight and then some I mean look it up, I don't know that but sure. Made some of that, made draw boards with you know You can make a draw board for probably less than thirty five, forty dollars. Right. You know, if you want to add a scale to it it's gonna add some cost, but just the actual bare bones essentials, I mean we have a uh, what about a one inch bolt that we just put through two sheets of plywood and coated it with some rubber and that's the post that we hold our the right. boat, the, the grip in the boat. A, a trailer crank. Yeah, on it, you know? it's a, it's just a bow winch. So, like I said, you can you can build one of those pretty inexpensively, and they're very very valuable. So I, I guess you know that that draw board into those first few areas. The bow press honestly is probably something I would do last because here's the deal: different bows, especially the beyond parallel limb bows, they require a specific attachment sometimes for different draw board or different bow presses. If you get to where, if you get to where you buy a, a bow and you buy a bow press and it's not adaptable for a specific bow, you've just potentially spent four to six hundred dollars on a bow on a right. press that you can't use. So you know you may actually look at a portable bow press, and um, because it's a little bit, it's a little bit harder to work on a bow that way, but in a pinch you can do it. So um, again, it goes back. How far do you want to go at the house, right? If you, if you just know budget. to do a, a budget and you want to do a few things, you know that portable bow press, that'll that'll be good for you at at the house. That'll be good for you in the field of the truck. It, it, it'll give you a lot more variety of, of variables, but it's not as easy to work on a yep. bow. It, it's not as efficient. In, um, but just like a truck, once you have a bow press, your buddies are all going to want to come over and use it. So you got to make sure 
you, you understand how that thing works, what limbs it works with, that kind of thing, because otherwise you're shooting bows all over you, you basically are walking a fine line with a bow press. If you don't know what you're doing, you can very easily damage a bow. Crack limbs, um, you know, bend risers. You can you can do a whole mess of bend cams. So be very cautious on what you do. I, I would say that we use uh, last chance last chance archery presses here. We got a few of them. We also have one that's now made by Specialty Archery, which is more like an X press. But it's uh, I would say that from a safety perspective, it's got more. Um, kind of parameters to, to double check to, to, to be uh, from, safe from where the, the, the bow can't pop out of the press or you know uh, just where it mounts to the limbs but those presses are up upwards of a thousand dollars um twelve hundred dollars depending if you get the ones that are got all the bells and whistles so but you can get a I think like a, a green model of the last chance press for in that four hundred dollar price range yeah. I believe there's even like you said on on archery talk and uh, you know there's other forums that it, People have built their own right. bow presses. Right. I, I don't. I, I don't highly suggest that one, but you know, if I'm depend on your budget, that, depend on how risky you want to get with it. Right. But they're there, right? So the tools are there. So again, uh, arrow vi uh, bow vice, excuse me, it, I would say is paramount. You know, having some serving, having some of those tools to to work on it. Um, a, a draw board, not very hard to put together. That's that's really simple to put together. Fletching jig, uh, an arrow saw. A, arrow squaring tool, a grain scale, those type of things are an arrow spinner. You know, yeah, that's probably, spinner, that's yeah. a big one. That, that's one that I think anybody should have. Yeah, period. Yeah, period. Because yeah. that's, that's an extremely important part of, of getting your set up. And, uh, and then a bow press kind of being last. Everybody. The, so, well, and then, uh, I mean, to, to one step further is, you know, maybe you set up, depending on what, what you have, your options, your house, you know, you set up a paper a tuning tunnel or, or some sort of, of tunnel to you know paper tune your bow if you're looking to get that far now i think that would be probably after after a, a press because if you're going to be paper tuning you're probably going to need to be pressing and twisting and, and i take you know i actually used to just get uh um i took a piece of plywood and i just cut a square out of the plywood and i would tape a piece of paper to it yeah. and i would just prop the plywood up and i'd shoot through the hole that i had the paper in and that's how i would initially work on my basement paper tuning stuff because I used what I had. I didn't have the fancy, you know, swing arm with the rack and everything. Right. So yeah, get creative with certain things. Um, it doesn't need to. It doesn't need to look fabulous to be functional, and functional is what really matters right. when you're talking about most of these tools. So there's obviously a bunch of small tools, and you know, like a Hamsky third axis level, and other things that we use in the process of, of tuning or setting up a bow that you can add you can supplement to your, your your shop as you go but anyway Austin thanks for the question uh, we're gonna send you uh, some alpha swag in the mail so I'll be getting a hold of you to get your your mailing address we're gonna go ahead and end this topic here and jump into another show and uh, answer some more questions so thanks for checking us out take care